Today is going to be a warning and a warning that I hope you take seriously. I also have an encouragement for you, and that encouragement is to study and show yourself approved. Now, the warning is in the title of this video or podcast, if you're listening to it, and that is of a false Christ and a false false millennium that's on the horizon, and very much so. Now, if you think I'm crazy, if you've never heard of this before, if you think this is impossible, then my encouragement to you is to go watch my end time series, which I'll put a link for in the description of this episode. And my encouragement for you is to go study that because I spent over 200 hours preparing and studying multiple perspectives and really diving to the truth and the heart of these issues. And most people aren't talking about the things that are in that series. There are some, but there's not many because most people have been deceived when it comes to end times events. And there's a, there's a plan, there's a narrative, there's a reason for that deception. And I'm going to touch on that reason today. Now, a couple of days ago, I saw this thing just randomly. Of course, everything is decreed by God, so there's no randomness to it. So obviously, God had in mind that I have a little message for you. But nonetheless, I saw this article on my feed, just a random article, right? It says, AI uses Catholic relic to show that Jesus, to show what Jesus looked like. A realistic depiction of Jesus has been created using generative AI and a mysterious Catholic relic. Gosh, so much mystery to this. Now, before I even get to the image and what it is, I want you to take note of two very important things. It says, AI uses Catholic relic to show what Jesus looked like. First off, how do you know what Jesus looked like? Does, does the Bible tell you that he had a goatee or he didn't or a beard, long hair, short hair? We have no clue what Jesus looked like. And that's by design. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But this already assumes that, oh, well, this is what Jesus looked like. See, this thing proves it. Well, wait a minute. How do you know what Jesus looked like? That's assumption number one. Assumption number two, which is based on this relic, is that the relic, it's the Shroud of Turin, if you've heard of that, is true. That it's, it's genuine. So therefore the AI's interpretation of this relic is what Jesus looked like. Now, if you look at this image, it is profound. It really is profound. If you look at it, I mean, I, I find it equally captivating, but also frightening that AI would create such an image because there is an allure to it. There is a sense like, wow, this is what Jesus looks like. And if you are listening to this, then, you know, simply just Google Jerusalem Post, I think it was on the 27th of April or April, September. I don't know where I got April from. Uh, September that they, of this year, 2023, that they published this story on the AI's rendition of Jesus from the Shroud of Turin. Just look it up. You'll find it. It's everywhere. But look at this. Look at the eyes. They're just so deep. And the hair, the goatee, I mean, it just looks like, wow, this is what Jesus looked like. It's very peaceful. At the same time, it's very unsettling that AI would create such a thing and so realistic and that would move you. And that to me is what motivated me to make this little short presentation because it's scary. Artificial intelligence has used the Shroud of Turin, a Catholic relic, to show a lifelike depiction of what Jesus may have looked like. At least they acknowledge that it may have looked like. We don't really know. May have looked like. Now, the Shroud of Turin has come under a lot of scrutiny, and it's been proven to be a fake. So if you should look up Shroud of Turin debunked, a lot of different articles on that. Basically, they've, they've found that it's probably made in the Middle Age, uh, medieval ages, like 1300s, possibly even 1400s, 1200s even. There's so many articles on this. I'm not. This is not about the Shroud of Turin, so I'm not going to spend time on it. You can even look up as the Shroud of Turin self-portrait. A lot of articles on that, and I'll read you one of them really quickly. Now, of course, it's not a self-portrait of Jesus. It's a self-portrait of whoever made it, in this case, possibly of Leonardo da Vinci. This article says, Is the Turin Shroud really a self-portrait by Renaissance man Leonardo da Vinci? He was the ultimate Renaissance man, studying anatomy, Renaissance, uh, designing a rudimentary helicopter, and creating some of the most admired paintings of the age. Now, look, before I continue, I want to say something. Whenever you see these types of 
I don't even know, platforming, idolizing, bringing somebody up to these heroes of old, you know, these ancient you know guys that were just so amazing and they were superheroes. You have to read them with a very fine grain, with very, you know, fine tooth comb, whatever the analogy is these days, but be very discerning. Why is that? Because history as we know it is very largely full of fabrications. I'm not saying all of history is fabricated, but especially the Renaissance and all these people. In my series, I talk about this with um, with Shakespeare. If you know anything about Shakespeare and the Jesuits, it's very likely that Shakespeare is a fictionary, a fiction a person. He's not a real person. He's he's a made up person that was made up for a particular end goal. If you know about the Jesuits and the theaters in Europe and the learning against learning that came out of the Counter-Reformation, basically as a way to counter the grassroots of the Reformation with propaganda. You think Hollywood is, it's, is where it started? It's been going on since the 1500s, man. Learning against learning. The theaters of Europe were all Jesuit theaters. And of course, Shakespeare was a big part of that with his plays, quote unquote. But whenever you read these, you know, these heroes, oh, he's the ultimate Renaissance man, like, oh my gosh. You have to be very discerning. I don't even know if Leonardo da Vinci was a real person. I'm just saying it. Now, is there absolute proof either way? I don't think so. But the point is, be discerning, because all these things, they're either created, either these people are fabricated, like Shakespeare, or they're created in the sense that they're propped up by the powers that be for a particular purpose, like Newton, like Galileo. Newton was an occultist. So was Galileo. So were all of them. Leonardo da Vinci was sponsored by the Medici family, if you know anything about that. So again, I'm not. this is not one of those episodes where we're going to do a deep dive, but I hope that you can read these things with discernment, but moving on. But could Leonardo da Vinci also have perpetrated history's greatest art forgery? Cue the dramatic music. That's the suggestion of one expert who claims that Leonardo was responsible for faking the Turin Shroud. Now, this there's article here goes on a pretty, you know, uh, in, in-depth way. And basically, Leonardo da Vinci was fascinated with Basically, a lot of optical things, optical illusions, crystal lenses. There's something called a camera obscura, which was actually used during that time. In fact, I saw a Facebook ad for a new camera obscura. It's basically they're bringing back this old technology, but it's actually very fascinating. The camera obscura is is this lens, basically, where you look through it and it allows you to sketch over like a projected image. Right? So you could basically look at something and trace it on a piece of paper. It's a very fascinating thing because it uses optics. It's a very fascinating tool. And this was designed, you know, hundreds of years ago. But Leonardo da Vinci loved this kind of stuff. He loved uh, camera obscuros, optics. He had a lot of stuff in his journals about optics. And so we also know that he he forged some other ones, you know, forged some other things. And the, the article goes into it. You know, look, Leonardo da Vinci was very likely a narcissist. Okay, if he was a real person. He was also sponsored by the Medici family, which I'll show you right here. This is an article. What's it titled? Leonardo da Vinci's patrons. Who paid for his art? Let's find out. Leonardo da Vinci's first patron was the Medici family. Whoops. The Medici were the de facto leaders of Florence who helped shape the Renaissance era through their patronage of the arts. My goodness. Now, this is a mainstream article, so it's not going to tell you anything other than, you know, the bare bones historical facts. But if you know anything about the Medicis, then you know what I'm getting at here. These people are propped up. And of course, you're not going to learn anything about these, just like you're not going to learn when people talk about the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds or Bill Gates going to Africa and giving them, donating so many jib jabs to all these kids and being being so philanthropic. Philanthropy is like the, the buzzword for the elite doing their thing. And, and if you know anything about this stuff, then look, you know where this is going. History exists. There are, not everything is fabricated, but a lot of it has been steered for a proper agenda. And this includes the Shroud of Turin uh, with Leonardo da Vinci and, and all the other stuff. So even Salvatore Mundi, if you know that painting, it's the mo- I think it's the most expensive painting in the world. 
Salvatore Mundi is possibly a self-portrait. I mean, there's people who've said that. They said it might be a portrait of somebody else that he used. I mean, it has some occult themes in it, you know, with the position of the hand and the crystal ball. It's just very weird. And Jesus looks very androgynous, if you know anything about how basically the elites, you know, worship androgyny and, and all that kind of stuff. Look, this is not a deep dive in that stuff. We talk about that in the end time series. But the point is, Salvatore, Leonardo da Vinci, there's a lot of controversy surrounding him, if he even existed. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the Shroud of Turin. It's been proven a fake, and most likely it's it's either a forgery by Leonardo the, himself or by somebody else who very much knew a lot of optical techniques and, and very, you know, specific. That's why people think it is Leonardo, because the, the way that it's done, it, it basically presumes that that person had a lot of knowledge of anatomy, somebody with specific skills. Okay, but that's besides the point. History as we know it, especially the Renaissance, is full of fabrication. If you've learned anything about the fabrications of books and sculptures and pieces of art in the Renaissance, it was just a massive forgery fest. There is so much that we don't know and that we think is history. And of course, all this stuff is mainstream. And if you look into it, you realize the truth. But here's the point. You're not going to know what Jesus looks like. And that is by God's decree. That is by God's earth, God's sovereign design that you do not know what Jesus looked like. You will when he comes back. And he's going to be the most beautiful person being ever that we, we you don't even have a way to comprehend how beautiful and amazing and marvelous he will be. We will marvel at him for eternity. That's how beautiful he's going to be. But in his first advent, Jesus was very just average. There was nothing about him that would throw you off balance. And the Bible tells you so in Isaiah 53, which is one of the prophetic passages. Isaiah 53, verse 2, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Now the key word here is desire. Very, very important key word. There was nothing about Christ's appearance that would emotionally throw you off balance, right? You're not going to fall head over heels over him. You're not going to think like, oh, this is the guy that's the king, right? Because this, if you look in history, if you look, for example, in the book of Samuel, when the Jews rejected God as king, rejected Christ as king, basically, they rejected their spiritual king. What, what did God do? Do you remember? Do you remember how he picked Saul and he gave them the king that they wanted, who was basically like everybody looked at Saul. He was the tallest. Like literally the Bible is, here's why, again, it's so important. The Bible is very intentional about details. So if it leaves details out, it's by design. God doesn't want you idolizing physical remnants of his physical life. You're going to worship God when he comes back. You're going to worship Jesus. I mean, obviously we worship every day, but I mean, like you're going to see the physical God when he comes back. But until then, the mind is wicked and we idolize things. We tend towards idolatry. We tend to, we, we have like, I, for example, I have a picture of Jesus on my phone. It's, it's an artist's rendition, just like everything else. He's got his hand out and, you know, there's light and it's really optimistic and encouraging. I'm like, if I'm going to turn my phone on, at least I can see Christ, but it's not really Jesus. So I have to constantly remind myself that this is not actually Jesus. It's just a rendition to remind you in your mind, like, oh, okay, Jesus, not that's Jesus on the phone. So this is a very, we have to struggle with this every, especially in the day and age where we have AI, where we have all these ways of creating images that are playing towards our flesh and towards our lust of the eyes. Very, very important. But the Bible gives you details about Saul that are very significant. They say, he says that Saul was the tallest in Israel. He was literally tall, dark, and handsome. That's how the Bible paints him. And when David was picked by Samuel, what did God tell Samuel? Samuel, don't look at appearances, for the Lord looks on the heart. He doesn't judge by outward appearances. Because Samuel looked at David's brothers, and some of them were very good looking. They look like a king. See where this is going? This is why this is so important. The Jews were always lusting after signs. And today, there's no different with the rest of the world. 
we lust after signs. We see something like this image and we say, oh my gosh, that's Jesus. <gasps> and it gets you in your heart and you start thinking emotionally instead of really having discernment saying, this is, this is an image. And where, what is the next logical step for this? Imagine people who are very superstitious and going to the Turin Shroud and saying, oh my gosh, they believe the Turin Shroud is the real thing. And then they see this AI image and, oh my gosh, it's the real Jesus. Then what if, a, what if Jesus, a Jesus shows up that looks like that? See where this is going? So important. But there was nothing about Christ when he came in his first advent to throw you off balance. There was nothing because he was there to show you the truth, not to show you his, be his physical beauty, not to charm you, not to persuade you with his looks or anything physical at all. Literally, he chose the humblest form, which is so profound. It's so profound. It really is just quite profound. But the Bible warns you about judging with appearances many, many times. Christ warned us the same. Don't judge by appearances. Judge with right judgment. So where am I going with this? Well, today, millions of people, Catholics, even some Orthodox, a lot of people go to these holy sites with relics like the Shroud of Turin, and there's this whole superstitious thing around it. If you know anything about holy sites, if you know anything about pagan worship, this is just pagan 2.0. The reason Christ died for your sins and for mine is so that geography would no longer play a factor in our relationship to God. Plain and simple. In the old days, whether you were pagan or Jew, it didn't matter. You had a special dedicated geography. The temple, once you were in the temple, it's holy ground. You know, outside of it, it's not holy ground. You had high places. You had all these different geographically significant places that people went to, and they're very superstitious about it. All Catholicism has done, all Christi you know, institutionalized Christianity has done with these relics is institute a new level of paganism wrapped in a Christian bow. People go there, they lay flowers down, candles, they kiss, you know, whatever the thing. I mean, they're saying their prayers. This is idolatry masked as Christianity. The heart is desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says. We tend towards idolatry and worshiping the creation. We have to constantly be careful of that. Like I said, with my phone, it's, it's, a, it's a real practice to remind myself, because I'll be thinking about something, like I'm upset about something, you know, I'm trying to pray pray to the Lord about it, and then I turn my phone on, and I see the image of Jesus, which is an artist's rendition. It's not what Jesus looked like, but, you know, it's the one I chose because it makes me feel comfortable. And I'm like, whoa, I'm not praying to my phone. What, what am I doing here? <laughs> That's not Jesus. Jesus is invisible, I mean, at least for the time being. He's he's there. He's always there, but he he's not in a phone. He's not in an image. So we have to be very careful with these things because the Bible teaches against it. And this is, this is why I did my end time series this is exactly the message I have for you today. Initially, I started this series because there's a lot of deception on end times events. There's a lot of people who are fooled. They're fooled by futurism. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today. But then as I was doing the series especially as I got to the third temple episode and really preparing for these episodes, it was very rigorous. I spent a lot of time preparing for these episodes and they're very in-depth, obviously. They're very they're a little on the longer end, but they're full of detail because not a lot of people are, are rigorous with their detail. They, they find, you know, people go on TikTok and you go to these five-minute rapture videos. That's not where you should be getting your theology, man. You have to study the word, especially with all the deception. You have to unlearn, which takes even more work. But nonetheless, I realized that it's not just about deception. Like, oh, well, there's a different way of reading end times events. No, 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 no. That different way is being fulfilled on purpose. So what's the ultimate end of that? What's the conclusion of the, of the false eschatology that's being fulfilled before our very eyes? With the physical third temple, with the peace accords in Israel and in the Middle East and all this stuff that's happening... All these dispensationalist, futurist ideas that seem like they're being fulfilled, and they are, but it's not Bible prophecy being fulfilled, at least not in the way that we think it is. It's a false eschatology. So 
where is this going? Well, it's going to a false Christ and a false millennial kingdom. Now, that's a big claim. And again, if this is news to you, if you think I'm crazy, then please entertain me. Go and watch my series, especially the Dark to Light episode, Mystery Babylon, Israel in the Third Temple, that's, I think, episode six, The Counterfeit Spirit. There's so many good episodes there that's going to really open your eyes to the true Antichrist power on the earth, number one, and to what it is doing to come back into power just like the Bible predicts. The kings of the earth will give their power to who? Mystery Babylon, riding the beast. The woman, which is always representative of a church, sits on seven hills. She wears red and purple. Who wears red and purple? The bishops and the cardinals. Who sits on seven hills? The Vatican, the papacy. It's the only church in the world that sits on seven hills. And in fact, the only other place with seven hills is Istanbul, which was Constantinople, which was where the church-state union began. And it ruled the earth for 1,300 years or more, actually, before 1798, where it received a mortal wound. And then the French Revolution was choreographed to begin the process of coming back to the beast. It's been a long process. That's how these people do things. They think on very long timelines. They think on long, long timelines, and they use the Kabbalah and duality to bring you to their desired crown, which involves going from dark to light, back to dark, back to light. The French Revolution, right after the mortal wound to the beast, the seeming mortal wound, began this process of left versus right. Before that, you just had monarchies. But we need, we need something different to bring the papacy back to power, the mystery Babylon back to power. And that is that people need to embrace Christian nationalism as a good thing. Well, how the heck do you do that? How the heck do you do that? Well, you create its opposite, which is atheism and secularism and communism. And you put these two against each other and they fight. And so, you know, for a while, one of them wins and the other one comes back. And that's exactly what happened. As you see in history, you see world war, you know, the world wars. Hitler was a light side Christian nationalist. Now, just because I'm saying Christian nationalist doesn't mean I say Hitler was a Christian. That doesn't mean that at all. It just means he was very in cahoots with the Pope. He loved the Pope. He loved the Jesuits. If you look at his empire, he was very much the light side versus who? The dark side, the communists. And of course, if you know your history, the Jesuits propped up communism, Marx and Engels, and that's the rest is history, as they say. But just like with Islam, the Catholic Church created Islam. I cover that in my series too. There's very good documentation for that. Islam got out of control. So what happened? The Crusades. That led to the Crusades, problem, reaction, solution. In this case, they were reacting to their own problem. Well, the same thing happened with communism. Communism got out of control after they got propped up, and so they propped up Hitler. And Hitler was the opposing side. And of course, we know that the communists won the world, the Second World War. But look, I mean, even other things too. You have the father of Zionism, Theodor Herzl, met with the Pope in the 1890s, early 19th century, late 1890s, something like that. Literally, Four decades later, five decades later, you had, within that period, two world wars that ultimately led to the creation of a state of Israel after 2,000 years of not having any nation politically at all. Suddenly, you have the state of Israel after the Pope met with the father of Zionism. And people think that, oh, now the third temple is being rebuilt and, and they're going to have their sacrifices and there's going to be a peace Middle East. Oh my gosh, we're going to get raptured. Or at the very least, these things are coming true, just like the Bible says. But does the Bible say these things? Or are you thinking of a false interpretation that you've been taught about what the Bible actually says? And this is the problem. Because if you remember history, and we talk about it in depth in the series, the Reformation identified who the beast was, very clearly so. All the Reformers believe the same thing. And it's very exegetically sound to believe what the Reformers believe on this topic. Because there is no other candidate for the first beast, 
Mystery of Babylon or the Little Horn, which are pretty much all the same thing in some sense. They're at different times. Mystery of Babylon is kind of the completion, but they're all referring to the same power, which is the papacy. There's no other candidate. No other candidate in history that has trotted on the saints, changed times and laws, sits enthroned in the temple of God, which is the church, which is the people, you know, the, the church, it's the invisible body of Christ is the temple, and proclaim himself to be Holy Father, to forgive sins. This is the truth. Now, that may upset a lot of you, especially if you're really, you know, hardcore, diehard Catholic, but this is not about Catholics. I'm not saying Catholics are evil. I went to Catholic schools. I went to a Jesuit high school. In fact, the ring that I have, my grandma bought me this ring as a graduation present. It's, a, it's from a Jesuit high school. Now, I wear it because it says, follow me on it. It's a message from Christ that Christ embedded in my life, even that early on when I really didn't know him. And today I look at it with, with fond memory. But I went to a Jesuit high school. I went, you know, I was Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. So I'm very familiar with that background. I have nothing against Catholics. But the system that you are wrapped up in is the beast that was prophesied by the prophets. The institutionalization and physicalization, making a counterfeit kingdom, a physical earthly kingdom where Christ came to give a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men and women through a decentralized system that was all obedient to him. Now we have a counterfeit system that's physical and everybody's obedient to the Pope because he's the vicar. He's the one in place of God on earth for you. Do you see how this works? Gosh, I really am tempted to go into it, but I'm not because the series does it very good justice. But look, Islam, Christianity, um, the Judaism, the Talmud, they all have an expectation of a future millennial reign. Islam, of course, because Catholics propped up Muhammad. All his advisors were Catholic converts or Catholics in general. Judaism teaches from the Talmud, and they've always had a, a worldly political salvation in mind, that there's this golden age that's going to come. And, of course, you have Christians who are post-millennials, dispensationalists, futurists of some kind, pre-millennials. Most Christians believe in a future millennial kingdom. Now, think about that. That's over 2 billion people that expect there to be this millennial kingdom. And the beast is actively coordinating to fulfill their false prophecy because they had to commit to it. When, when the Counter-Reformation was started and the Jesuits were started and all these theories started coming out, one of them being futurism, they not only had to disseminate that information and, and to basically say, look, well, this is what's happening. They had to commit to it to fulfill it because if it's not coming true, at least it's, let me put it this way, at least if it seems like it's not coming true, then that totally delegitimizes their position. But it has, quote unquote, come true. And you see it in history. Oh my gosh, there's a state of Israel now. Well, yeah, because Theodore Herzl, the father of Zionism, met with the Pope. And Hitler was also instrumental in the state of Israel, even though most people think maybe he wasn't. But anyway, that's another can of worms. So... Then you have the third temple now being built. And oh my gosh, Bible prophecy is coming true. There's the peace going to be in the Middle East. They're having a, a peace agreement. There's the Yannicka guy who's he's some rabbi, magical rabbi doing miracles. And people are, all the dispensationalists are thinking, is this the, the, the false prophet? Is this the Antichrist? Pin the tail on the Antichrist. Well, first off, the beasts in Revelation and Daniel are systems and kingdoms. They're not individuals. The false prophet is a beast. It's a system. And we talk about who that system is and how that system will work as a false prophet to bring people back into allegiance to the first beast, which was the papacy, which was the Christian nationalist system that ruled the earth for over 1,300 years. History repeats itself. That's the longest empire on earth. And it was a seemingly Christian empire. Do you think it's going away? I don't think so. But watch those episodes. Watch the Dark Delight episode. Watch the Counterfeit Spirit. The wound healed in 1928, or 1929, I believe, with the Lateran Pact. And the San Francisco Chronicle, I believe, even said, healing the wound. That was the wording. That, isn't that fascinating? 
Now, of course, that was healed politically because the papacy got all its papal states back. It was recognized and blah, blah, blah. Of course, it was always pulling the strings anyway, but then it came back into the public light. But healing the wound spiritually, we are in transition to that. Mystery Babylon, when the woman rides the beast, meaning a church-state union, and the kings of the earth give their power to this through some sort of you know, worldwide federation of Christian nationalist states. Gosh, it sounds so crazy, doesn't it? And if you think I'm crazy, again, go watch the series. I, I'm, I'm really saying these things based off a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence. If you are willing to entertain it, that's the question. But that's what's on the, that's what's on the horizon is the woman riding the beast. And we're in transition to that wound being spiritually healed. People have marveled after the Pope and continue to marvel after the beast. Look at the chosen. Look at the passion of the Christ. All these things, gosh, we cover all these in the series in depth and how they're just designed to make a Catholic culture and to bring people back into one mindset. But now what is the end of this prophecy? If they're going to coordinate a false antichrist to walk into a physical temple, because everybody's expecting physical things, they're not looking at what spiritually happened, how the power walked into the actual temple, <clears throat> which is the body of Christ, which is the church, <clears throat> how that already happened with the papacy. But if people are expecting the obvious, well, oh, some dude's going to walk into the temple, watch. And then let's say a Jesus figure appears that looks like this AI image generation. And he even appears supernaturally. <clears throat> and he does miracles and he destroys this big bad antichrist that walked into a physical temple do you think that a lot of people will discern that that's not jesus do you think a lot of people would realize whoa we're being shammed here this is not actually what the bible says vice versa or the opposite would happen that people would be all over the world convinced that we have entered the millennial reign do you see what satan is doing here He's going to make himself look so good. He's going to masquerade as the son of God. And people in the second century believed this. In the Didac, which is a historical document, that's what the Christians believed, that, the, that Satan would masquerade as the son of God. The, the end all deception of all deceptions would be that the devil would masquerade as the son of God, as Jesus. And because most people don't read their Bibles and they're not familiar with the trajectory of history and where it's going, they're not familiar that, yes, when Jesus returns, we'll meet him in the air. The angels are going to come get us and we're going to meet him in the air supernaturally. The wicked will be destroyed. There's going to be a lot of supernatural things happening. The resurrection is going to happen. But if people think that the resurrection maybe is after the millennial reign, and that we have to Christianize the world, and that's when Jesus appears. Oh my gosh, he's here, look! He appeared, see, we Christianized the world. Most post-millennialists believe that this is the truth, that we have to Christianize the world, the seven mountain mandate. Do you know who sits on seven mountains? What does the book of Revelation tell you? It tells you that the Antichrist power sits on seven mountains. It's, it's the little horn, it's the first beast, it's mystery Babylon. It's all the same power. The city of seven hills. That's Rome. Now you know where the seven mountain mandate to Christianize the world comes from. Now look, I'm all for people learning the gospel. Hallelujah. That's going to be great. Now not everybody's going to be saved, but I'm all for the gospel. But that's not what the seven mountain mandate is about. The seven mountain mandate is about Christianizing every aspect of everything. Government, education, science, you know, it's a Christian totalitarian government. That is not from the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Holy Spirit told you to do. The Holy Spirit told you to go spread the gospel, not to unify church and state. That's a message from the Antichrist spirit because it wants to come back into power and it will come back into power because that's what God has decreed. And now the onus is on us. In Matthew 24, one of the key end times texts what does Jesus say? Let's look at it. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Literally, the first thing that Jesus tells you 
is do not be deceived. See that no one leads you astray. What's the second thing he tells you? Many will come saying, I am the Christ. What about the very last one that comes? There have been a lot of false Christs. What about a one that actually looks like Jesus? Or I should say that plays to our expectation of what Jesus looks like. Like this AI image, like, ooh, wow, that that is super spiritual looking. He's got super long hair. He's got a goatee. He's got these like beautiful, gentle eyes that just entrance you. That's a red flag for me. Because the Bible says there's nothing about him that makes us desire him at all, which is profound, which is really profound. But that's God's design so that you could focus on the truth. You'll have all of eternity to, to focus on him and just be totally in love and, and head over heels with the fully revealed Christ. But when he first came, it was not about the looks. It was about judging with the right judgment. But if people are expecting a... Think about how many New Age people, too, expect a New Age Christ, Christ consciousness. It's all coming to a head, people. It's all coming to a head. And if they fulfill this third temple false prophecy... And a, a Jesus shows up doing miracles and destroys some sort of, you know, antichrist figure in quotation marks that walked into the temple. How many people are going to be deceived that we've ushered in the golden age, that we're here now? That's it. We're, Christ is going to have to rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And well, guess what? If you're one of those few cantankerous fellows that see through the lie you're one of the enemies that has to be put under his feet. And all those crazy Christian nationalists, all those post-millennialists will be so convinced that you're a heretic that they will gladly kill you. They will gladly put you in prison. Do you see where this is going? Do you see how history repeats itself? And of course, this is going to be the last repetition. So it's going to be the craziest. This is where it's going. If you don't meet Jesus in the air when he returns because the angels have brought you up there, it's not the real deal. That can't be faked. Rapture, maybe, who knows, with holograms. I don't know. We're living in a crazy time right now. But the question of today is this. Are you ready? Are you ready for this to go from dark to light? Eve was not tempted by Satan. She wasn't... Satan didn't appear to her in a, in a giant red dragon form and said, you better eat this fruit or I'll kill you. He didn't say that. He appeared to her in a very inviting, non-assuming form and basically played to her desires, her lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's what John says, right? Lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Selfish ambition, selfish desires. So it's always been about desire. That's why Isaiah says there was nothing about him that made us desire him. Desire, it's all about desire. Because he didn't come the first time to sway you with his looks or to make you think emotionally at all. He made he came to reveal the truth to you so that you would learn to have right judgment and to judge by the word of God. Not by how things look, by what you expect, by how obvious things are. This is the devil. The devil always pulls your attention back to the flesh. That's how you know. That's one of the signature moves of the devil. Is, is bringing you to the obvious, bringing you to the literal, bringing you to the, to the physical, because that's how you get snared. And sadly, most people are snared. So where is the, what is the next step for this AI image? When I saw that, I, was, I had a mixture of emotions of, wow, that's, my first emotion was like, wow, oh my gosh, like, like, that's really Jesus. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. No, it's not. <laughs> wait a minute. We don't know what Jesus looked like. There, there's no, he could have had short hair. Literally, he could, have, he could have been bald. He could have had no beard. He could have had a beard. Who knows? There's literally no detail about anything in terms of his facial features in the Bible. And there's some very early drawings. And some of them, the earliest drawing, if I'm not mistaken, he has short hair. So <laughs> go figure, right? So this whole Jesus... AI Jesus, this is prepping the world for a Christ consciousness, new age Jesus, false golden age, false Christ situation. 
And combined with the false fulfillment of all these false eschatologies that are being coordinated to be fulfilled so that you believe that, oh, we're, we're going through Bible prophecy. Now, we are going through Bible prophecy, absolutely, but not in the mainstream way that you are being told. Because the mainstream way is trying to guide you to its own outcome. It's trying to guide you to its own outcome. And basically, what is that outcome? Well, that outcome is a false millennial reign. And possibly, I think, very possibly, a false Christ. If that's the case, will you be one of the people that gladly worship because you don't have discernment? Or will you be one of the few voices that will speak against it and not bow the knee to a false Christ or a false light world order, a false golden age that invites you in and says, come on in, the water's fine. A lot of people are going to take the mark. And when Jesus says that it'll be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot, what does that mean? People are celebrating and giving a marriage because they took the mark, because it's going to be easy. It's going to be great. It's going to be, oh my gosh, it's going to be so much desire to go into this system. Is that desire going to be fueled by a false Christ? Who knows? I think it's very possible. Is that desire going to be fueled by a golden age? Absolutely. The dark to light thing is just an illusion. It's just designed to move you up the Kabbalah tree to the crown, the capstone on your dollar bill. So I digress. There's a lot of things that I could talk about. There's a lot of things in the end time series that are worth viewing if you are even familiar with end times things. I highly encourage you to go see the counterfeit spirit episode, the dark to light episode, the image of the beast, mystery Babylon, all those are very good ones. But if you are very intimidated by end times events, go from the very beginning, go check it out. I promise you will learn quite a bit. My goal with that series was to help anybody, especially if they're intimidated, because I was intimidated by end times events, but especially if they're intimidated to give them a solid foundation that they are not deceived. That is my goal. That's my mission statement with that series. And I believe that I have achieved it. Glory to God. Glory to God because I knew nothing about end times events. And God, in a very intense period of my life, showed and brought information into my life and helped me study the word and brought current events to my attention, helped give me energy to research and do all these things. And so all glory to him. But I hope that you will entertain these things so that you can learn the truth and not be deceived. Because the future is a crazy one. And it could be, the be it'll seem like the best thing that ever came, and yet it's going to be the greatest deception in the history of man. So I'll leave it at that and go check out the series. Until next time, stay sharp. Hey, thanks for being here. If you enjoyed today's show, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you want in-depth Bible studies, free resources, encouragement, or if you just want to get in touch with me, check out danceoflife.com. Until next time, God bless.